All right, this is Tom on board Thalia, and uh, we recently came through the Welland Canal that connects Lake Erie with Lake Ontario. So I wanted to share some tips and tricks about the Welland Canal. Uh, just as a caveat, this was our first time through the canal, and so I'm by no means a, a huge expert, but we learned a lot by doing it the first time, and would have appreciated some advice uh, from pleasure boaters about how to deal with the canal. So we're sharing that information with you and um, if you have anything else to add, if you've been through the Welland Canal, um, please comment on the video. So um, first off, um, in terms of contacting the canal authority, um, the best way to reach them, well, the, the main way to reach them is through VHF channel 14. That's the channel that they monitor. And uh, there's also a phone number if you go on the uh, Great Lakes uh, or St. Lawrence Seaway Waterway Canal Authority, something like that, you'll see that the St. Lawrence Waterway controls the Welland Canal um, and the locks through the St. Lawrence River out to the Gulf of St. Lawrence and a couple other smaller canals. Um, but if you look on there, you should be able to find a phone number for them. I had to dig around a lot to find the phone number. I called them the uh, evening before and uh, to clarify the procedures for starting through the canal and it wasn't easy to find the phone number. Um, I ended up having to call them on VHF channel 14 and ask for the phone number to call to contact the main office. So um, that's kind of an introduction to how the process works. It's, it's, it's not a pleasure boat oriented experience. <laughs> the Welland Canal is really there for commercial traffic and uh, they let pleasure boaters through when their space and at their convenience. So you'll have to deal with that. I wouldn't say that their customer service is terribly high and they're very not very important to pleasure boaters. Um, that's just the way it is. So anyway, um, contact them through VHF channel 14. When we went downbound through the canal, so the instructions I'm gonna give you are related to going down uh, down the levels from lock eight to lock one. If you're going upbound, obviously, um, it'll be kind of the reverse of what I'm explaining to you. And there's a couple unique factors for upbound that I'll, I'll try to touch on, um, both from what we observed and from other friends we've talked to have gone upbound on the Welland Canal. But again, our experience is um, from the downbound perspective. So the first thing is, um, you know, getting contact in them. You can, there's a courtesy dock right before the first bridge on the canal as you enter into Port Colburn. And you can tie up with that courtesy dock. Um, some people believe it was just for day use only, but we saw people tie up overnight there. And there's no signs that said no overnight usage, so you can tie up there. Uh, for larger boats like ours, uh, 40 feet, there's really, I only saw like two spots on the dock that are tied to. Uh, on the uh, two T ends of the, of the two finger pairs. So keep that in mind. We actually took a slip at the Port Culver Marina. Um, it was just more comfortable that way. And um, so I would suggest the best route is to find their phone number and call them uh, and ask for, let them know your intentions. So I called them and I said, we'd like to go in through the lock, uh, through the canal tomorrow morning. Um, I told them there was another pleasure boat um, nearby us so it's having the same plans and you want to try to do that you want to try to bunch up with other boaters as much as you can if you're around other boaters are doing it together or you meet somebody who's going to be going through um, they don't like to take a single boat through by itself they like to bunch them up so you may end up waiting uh, a couple hours or a whole day uh, for that to happen when we tied up at the port colburn marina um, we ran into a boat that we had seen uh, a couple days earlier and they were going to go through the canal as well, power boats. So when I called the canal authority on the phone, uh, I said there's two of us in company that want to take the canal. Uh, they said we'll call us in the morning. And so uh, I called them in the morning. Our plan was to leave the dock at 6.30 in the morning. And um, I called them on the phone and they said, yep, you're clear to proceed. So go ahead and uh, you know head towards the, uh, the first bridge. So that was good news. We didn't have to wait at all. We planned to drop lines at 6.30 and start the first bridge transit at 7. Um, and that's the way it worked out for us. So um, that was pretty smooth. But I've heard many tales of people waiting hours, if not 
the 24 hours to get through. So plan accordingly on that one. So again, VHF channel 14 is a way to contact them. Um, again, you can type at the courtesy dock. There is a phone booth at the courtesy dock. It's uh, looks like a traditional, this old phone booth. It's got a flashing blue light on top. And uh, they had originally told us to proceed to the courtesy dock and call on the phone there. And I said, well, can I just call you? I've got a cell phone. Can I just call you from where I am right now? And you can tell me whether we can go through or not. And they kind of hesitantly said, yeah, okay. You can do that as well. So you don't necessarily need to type at the courtesy dock. But it is an option there. There's a phone. You just pick up the receiver and it goes right to their uh, Canal Authority headquarters. Um, a couple other preparatory things before I explain going through the locks itself. Um, there's a toll for going through the locks. Uh, this is 2017 and at this time you could go online and buy um, through their links on their website and using PayPal. Um, it costs $200, either U.S. or Canadian. So obviously with the exchange rate we chose Canadian dollars. Uh, $200 online or uh, it's $30 a lock if you pay cash. Um, at the time that you show up with credit card. So it's either $240 at the time, kind of at the door, or $200 online. So if you go online, you want to make sure you have a place so you can print out your receipt. So we were at the marina and they had a business office that we used to print out our PayPal receipt. You want that paper that's approved to them that you pay. So you want to take care of that ahead of time. Um, and um, they, they also have a pleasure craft guide on the website. I recommend you download that and read through that ahead of time. It has lots of information there. Um, you know, they did put some effort into it, but some of the stuff was a little incorrect, we found, or outdated. And some of it applied to other canals, not necessarily the Welland Canal. Um, particularly all the information about lights and signals and all that. Um, it was difficult to navigate through to figure out what really applies to the Welland Canal as opposed to other canals. Um, so again, read that guide carefully. Um, one thing you'll see in the guide is that you're going to be required to tie to different sides of the locks depending upon which lock it is. And they describe in the guide which lock you tie port side to, which one you tie starboard side to. So very important you have that. We actually wrote that up on a list of paper and taped it to uh, in the cockpit so we could see it. And uh, that way you know um, you know where to move the fenders over uh, between locks. So very important there. Um, okay, so when you're underway, starting to go down through the canal, you want to make sure you're monitoring VHF channel 14 at all times. They require you to do that. In fact, they supposedly require you to get their approval before you leave 14 to even call somebody on 16 or something like that. What we ended up doing is we kept our main radio on channel 14 and I had a handheld radio uh, because we were talking back and forth with the other boat, uh, pleasure boat that was going through with us. Um, so that's the way we handled that. Um, the other thing to be aware of on the radio side is that the each of the locks, we just didn't discover this and it wasn't written in the guide until we got there, uh, we discovered that each lock has a blue sign at the very beginning of the lock that uh, says VHF or whatever, and say the channel that they monitor. And I didn't realize that the locks actually have a different channel than 14, but they do. So you want to look for that, and that's another good reason to have a handheld VHF available, so you can call them on that other channel while you're still monitoring 14. Um, there were channels in the 70s generally, like 71, 74. Some of the channels we didn't have on our handheld, so that was kind of a pain. But um, you can use that to call the lock. Um, that you're approaching, as opposed to 14, which is the general uh, canal authority. They go by the name of Seaway Welland, so when you call them on the radio, make sure you use the, the, the station name of Seaway Welland. Um, and you'll hear other ship traffic calling them, or them calling ship traffic that name. So Seaway Welland is the name for them. Um, if you have um, AIS on your boat, uh, definitely use that. It's helpful to see what ships are coming towards you up the canal, the direction, or ships that are coming behind you. Uh, it just helps you to be a little more aware. You'll, he be, you'll hear them being called on the radio, but it's helpful to know where they are in the canal system. Um, when you're going downbound, you're required to have um, two people on board, minimum two people. 
and that's for um, safety for handling the lines and all that. If you're going upbound, you have to have a minimum of three people. So, um, like for instance, Karen and I would not have been able to go upbound unless we hired a crew. And you can, there's information on their website and you can also Google, um, Google it as well, but there are people, some of them are ex-employees of the canal that will come on board your boat. I think it was around $200 a day for the transit, um, but um, you'll be required to do that if you don't have that minimum number of people. And if you're all concerned about your strength or your ability to handle the boat and coming up to lock walls and holding on the lines and all that, it's not a bad idea to get somebody extra as an extra set of hands. The more people, the better. Uh, I would say that we struggled with two people this time. Have a third person that's going downbound. Going upbound is more tricky uh, with the water filling locks and more pressure on your boat. So keep that in mind as far as um, people availability and all that. Um, it's uh, it's very easy to damage your boat in the locks, and if you've ever been through any of the locks, you'll you'll um, know what I'm talking about. Um, it's hard to control the boat as you're coming into the lock. You're going so slow. Uh, you don't have a lot of steerage. And um, you can also get uh, a lot of fluky winds in the log. And um, it's also easy just to be distracted. Your, your attention is distracted from so many things going on. So keep that in mind. Uh, get the biggest, best fenders and the most you can available. Uh, we have two large round fenders here that are stowed back here at the moment. Um, extra large, I can't remember exactly how big they are, but they were, they were oversized for our boat. Um, originally when we had a dock that slipped, but they've been super for this uh, experience going through the canals. Uh, we tend to like the round fenders. They give the most um, uh, distance between the hull and the, the lock. Um, but we also used some cylindrical fenders and also fender boards. So that actually ended up being very helpful too. The fender boards were extremely helpful. And the other boat that went through with us also used fender boards. So plan out how you're going to be fended off. And um, again, the more fenders you can have and spaced all the way down the length of your boat is important because you may end up coming in and the bow may end up getting blown into the wall or the stern may be end up blown in and you want to be prepared for that. Um, You'll want to wear work gloves, some kind of um, heavy leather ideal work gloves other than your normal like um, sailing gloves or something like that. Uh, you'll be using your hands a lot to handle lines. you want to prevent rope burn and, and all that. Um, so that's that. And also it's good to have uh, boat hooks handy to push off of the wall um, rather than just using your hands. That's, that's helpful as well to have all that available. Um, also, you're going to want to think through a plan for the other end of the canal. It's going to be, it's going to take you all day to get through. And you want to think about, what, are you going to stay at a marina on the other end? Um, there's a courtesy dock on each end, as I mentioned. Um, there's not a lot of space there. So we ended up finding space on the other end on lock one. We were the only boat there, but there was only space for two, maybe three boats there. Uh, so you want to think that through and make reservations accordingly ahead of time. Uh, and have, have a plan there for where you're going to overnight. Um, you also want to make sure that you um, have extra lines available, dock lines. They're going to provide you lines uh, to come through and pick up, but extra lines are helpful because you're going to need to, more than likely, uh, need to tie off on uh, a wall partway through the canal to wait for commercial traffic to go through. So have dock lines ready and available for that and very long dock lines, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, you, if you're a sailboat, you cannot sail through the canal, so don't try that, they won't allow it. Um, you know, make, sure, make sure you have plenty of fuel and are ready for the whole transit through. Um, you also want to think through other things like making sure there's water and food or snacks available for your crew. You're going to be busy and working. The only time you really have downtime is between lock 8 and lock 7. Uh, it's quite a bit of distance, about 10 miles there. <coughs> but the other time, you're going to be busy working the whole time. So you want to make sure you have water and food for people to um, keep them hydrated and, and energy level up. Um, also helpful to have a pair of binoculars so that you can look forward and, and see down to the lock you're approaching or the bridge that you're approaching. Um, all right.
right, so um, let's get into going through the canal itself. So again, I'm talking about downbound. Um, the, your experience will be reverse if you own upbound. Um, you're contacting them on VHF channel 14. They've given you approval to proceed. As you proceed, you're going to reach a bridge. It's the first thing you're going to see. They, at that point, they know you're coming. And what you're looking for on the bridge, uh, it's a lit bridge. And um, you're looking for a green light. So on the bridge itself, there'll be a red light. Uh, I believe it's just a red light and a green light. And the red light is solid. Um, until you get closer and when it starts to flash red it means that basically they see you and they're in the process of raising the bridge so that as the bridge is being raised you'll see a flashing red light you want to wait still and hold until the bridge is all the way up and you see the green light on the bridge and that's your signal to proceed through um, for all of this for all the bridges and locks they um, they know you're coming through, so you don't have to call each individual lock or bridge on the radio necessarily. You can if you want to, to get information, but um, they know you're coming and they're prepared for you. So um, it's not like you have to call each individual one and request openings. So you're gonna go through that bridge, then you're gonna go into the first lock, lock eight. Lock eight is an equalizing lock, meaning that it's not the normal uh, full height of all the other locks, but it depends on the level of Lake Erie. Uh, when we came through, it was just a four foot drop. And this is also where they collect your toll um, amount or the, the receipt for the payment. And um, so that's at, at the first of lock eight. So be prepared to hand that over to them. They'll give you like, they'll pass over like a big fishnet thing on a pole and they'll give you a printout of the pleasure craft guide and they also you have to put your payment in there they were helpful there they answered some questions i had um, and it was a mellow lock just with four foot drops not too bad um, but it'll be your first experience coming through they'll you'll see that there's two lines that they provide you they're half inch polypropylene floating lines um, one for your bow one for your stern and so this will be your first uh, kind of warm up for him with all the rest of the locks. They will throw the lines coiled up to you and so that's why it's important to have somebody on the bow and the stern ready to take those lines. Um, and um, I'll get into this a little bit further but uh, we found the best procedure for the lines which was recommended to us by another boater was to use snatch blocks and um, to put those snatch blocks on the tow rails at the uh, bow and the stern and then when they throw the line to you, you open up the snatch block, put the line through, and then you can control the tension on the line. Uh, if you don't have that, you can also run through uh, a chalk or fair lead, and then to a winch or to a cleat. But those lines are gonna take a lot of load in periods of time. So you wanna have a place to lash it off quickly and hold your boat in position um, while, the, while they get ready to lower the log or raise the log. So snatch blocks, definitely the way to go. Um, if you don't have some and you have time, I would purchase a pair of snatch blocks because they're very helpful. So again, it's not a very large line, a half inch line, and um, but so size your blocks and your um, lashing points accordingly for that. Um, oh, another thing, uh, just in terms of preparation. So if you are, have a dinghy with you, you'll have to put that dinghy up on deck. We got trapped by this, we were towing our dinghy, and after we had passed through the first lock, they radioed us and said, you can't tow a dinghy through the canal, and so we had to pull over at one of the walls, tie up, and uh, hoist the dinghy up on the deck. So make sure it's, uh, it's up on, on deck or on davits, you can't tow anything like a dinghy or a kayak or whatever through the water. Um, so you've done lock eight, and that's the beginning kind of a warm up noticing a dead bird on the water. Um, you've done the warm-up through lock eight. Now you have a stretch of time between there and lock seven to kind of um, get prepared for the next um, next seven locks. Um, it's a good time to talk about limit of approach signs or LA signs and you'll see this you'll see this written up in the guide um, and it was a little confusing until we actually saw them and I'll try to include a picture of the limit of approach signs. It's basically kind of like a stop sign to cue you up to make sure you don't proceed too far towards the lock or the bridge uh, until they're ready. And they usually have three of them, so they'll have LA3, and then LA2, and LA1, and then the actual lock. 
uh, and they have lights on them. So if there's a red light on the first sign, LA3, as you're approaching, you want to stop and hold your position there. Um, as it, if it flashes red, it means you get ready. If you're tied off at a, at a wall, you should get ready to, to drop your lines. Um, and as the flashing red goes away, then you can proceed to the next limit of approach sign. So again, the red means stop and hold. As soon as the red light's off, then you can proceed. If you're proceeding towards the lock and none of the LA signs are lit up, it means there you can keep going. And as you proceed through, the last thing you're looking for is a green light on the lock itself or the bridge. So they can have a red light, uh, flashing red, or they can have a green light. Green light means simply that you can proceed. So you should be prepared to hold in your position or to tie off on a wall um, if you see those limit of approach signs in red. Um, so that's that. Um, when you're approaching the lock, it's best to uh, be prepared to secure the stern line first. You're going to have momentum going into the lock. You're going to want to have a little bit enough speed to steer with, and then you're going to want to stop the boat immediately. What they did with us is they brought us all the way into the front of the lock, so, and we were the first boat in, so you're right up there in the front, so you have to kind of like steer in and then stop quickly. And we did reverse a little bit to sort of stop the movement of the boat, but it's hard to do reverse and also catch the line from the, the lock attendant. So be prepared for that stern line. You want to get it on the snatch block quick and um, get it around a winch or cleat to stop the boat's movement. And uh, that can be tricky if it's just two of you. Another reason to have more hands on the boat. So that's a good line to attach first. And then if your other crew members up in the bow catching the bow line, they can, uh, they can control the bow and the swinging out or in of the bow line accordingly. Uh, but be prepared to secure that stern line first. For us, being two people, me driving the boat most of the time, so um, I had to drive, slow the boat down, get it in position, get it right in the right spot, and grab the stern line and secure it first. So it's a lot to do on the stern. So again, if you have a third person, I would have them be ready on the stern and taking that stern line while the um, helmsman is doing their thing, controlling the boat. Um, as you're going down the lock, uh, again the first lock is minor, 4 feet, all the other locks are going to be I think 46 feet drop. So they're going to, you're, you're going to grab those lines, if you're lucky you'll have two attendants, sometimes you might only have one attendant, but two attendants throwing you lines, um, and you'll grab those to secure those, and um, they'll uh, secure the other boats that are with you. And um, another thing I did mention in the beginning is that you should be prepared to raft up. You uh, either raft up to another boat or have a boat raft up to you. We were lucky that we didn't have this, but I would have complicated things a lot because, you know, hopefully the other boat has fenders and they can put fenders out on their side when they come in next to you. But um, it's just complicated uh, to get all the boats tied up like that. And then, of course, you're, if you're the boat against the wall, you've got a lot more pressure and pull on the boat as uh, the other boat next to you is rafted to you and being blown around by the wind. When we came through, we had winds gusting to 25 knots and it was very tricky maneuvering the boat into the lock and I can't imagine how it would have been like to have um, other boaters rafting up to us, but be prepared for that because that can happen. Um, so once they've determined that you're secure and the other boats are secure, they'll come by and they'll, they'll um, make sure they ask if you're ready. You will also see, and I'll try to include a picture of this too, um, a big boom that comes down at the front of the lock. It picks up this heavy cable and takes it out of position. That's an emergency stop cable, uh, mostly for bigger ships, but they also have available there for pleasure boats. So um, that is a, um, that's to the last moment of time when they, they bring the boom down and lift that heavy cable up. And then you'll start to see the water uh, uh, you'll start to see the water coming out of the lock and dropping at that point. So at that point you want to make sure that both people that are controlling the lines are talking to each other and coordinating the position of the boat um, and making sure that one end of the boat doesn't slip out away from the wall more than the other. Um, regardless, it may be hard to just hold the position parallel to the wall. You might find that the boat moves forward and back and uh, it's, it's hard with only two lines. Um, and especially as you get lower down the lock and the, and the line is vertical. Um, 
Yeah, I think it's thought of it in terms of the position of the of lines and the use of snatch blocks. Another reason why it's good to use a snatch block on the tow rail is because it's on the most outward portion of your hull. And the, the reason I say that and draw your attention to that is because the line, when you first go in the, into the lock, the line's going to be almost horizontal over to the, um, to the bollard. And then as you go down, it's going to be almost vertical. So, for instance, you don't want the line to go through part of your lifeline area and get caught up as it goes vertical. You want to think about, is, is, will the line run free going horizontal and vertical out away from that snatch block? So position that or choose a fair lead on your boat that will not get um, hung up with a line going vertical. On our boat, there was, it rubbed against the, the bimini frame when it went vertical and it was close to the, our solar panel array. So those are all things you want to consider when you're positioning the, the lines on your boat. Another word about fenders. Um, so sailboats versus powerboats, you're going to want to think about the position of your fender related to the shape of your hull. What I mean by that is that uh, a lot of powerboats have sort of a flare uh, to their hull, on the side of their hull, pushes you up towards the bow. And um, you're going to want to think about where to position your fender in terms of where it's going to contact the wall of the canal. Um, if you're downbound, like we were, and the powerboat that was in company with us had their fenders up quite high and the first lock we came to, a lock 8, uh, the lock wall was maybe, I don't know, two, and a, two feet above the water and, um, you know, it was basically, if they had floated all the way up against the wall, they would have had concrete against their hull because their fenders were too high. They were up closer to uh, where their gunnel was um, at their deck level. Which would make sense to have the fenders up there if you're upbound, and that's the first contact point against a 46 foot high wall. Uh, but when you're approaching a lock to go downbound, um, some of the, like I said, some of the walls are not very high up the water. I can't advise you exactly the dimensions of each one, and it's going to depend upon a lot of different conditions. But I think the best advice is just to give you is that um, to have people ready to adjust the fender heights as you're approaching or as soon as you can see the conditions at that lock. Um, don't just assume that you tie them off in one spot and they're good to go. You may have to have them right down at the water level, particularly as I mentioned on a, on a power boat that has a, where they flare out and um, have them right down next to the water line to be the point where your boat's gonna touch the wall. So that's, uh, that's fenders. Okay, so you're, uh, they're starting to empty the lock and the boat's starting to go down. Uh, as I mentioned, you're controlling the position of the boat as best you can with the two lines of bow and stern. Um, we had to use the light forward and reverse occasionally to, as the boat, uh, we'd swing forward on the wall or back on the wall too far than where we were comfortable. So that could be an option for you to do a little bit of controlling. Obviously, if you have a bow thruster, you're fortunate. Uh, we didn't, but if you have a bow thruster, it's very helpful to uh, position the, the boat against the wall. Just be conscious of the other boats around you, particularly if you have boats wrapped to you. If you're using a bow thruster that's pushing water uh, against them or pulling water um, from their boat to your boat, so it can cause other boats to have difficulty controlling their position. So be, just be conscious of that with a bow thruster. Um, as, you're, as you're going down in the lock, um, while you're sort of hanging out there, letting the line out slowly, um, it's a good time, and if you can do this before you go down, the, the water starts to drop all the better, but it's a good time to take all the extra line that they've tossed to you and neatly coil it right where you're, you're standing or working. Uh, the reason for that is as they start to lower you down, you're going to be feeding out the line gradually and um, you don't want that line to get snagged up or knots to form in the, in the line. It's polypropylene, so it doesn't really lay down very well, but you, so you want to make nice coils, clean coils of that line as you're getting prepared to be lowered in the lock. Um, and then as you get down all the way down to the bottom of the lock, the, um, you might hear the lift attendants yell out something like, okay, or let go. We didn't know what that was at first uh, on our first lock. But they're basically saying, telling you to let go of the line, and uh, that you're that you're on your own at this point. 
and what they do up there is they rapidly pull the line up on their side. So that's another reason why you want to have that line nicely coiled because you're going to have, we, we might have had like 20 extra feet of line uh, when we were down at the bottom of the lock. And they're pulling that line up fast and you don't want it to get snagged on anything as you're trying to maneuver off the wall and go through the open lock gates. So another reason to have that line nicely coiled. Um, if you're fortunate, you'll have two people uh, pulling, one person pulling each line, going up, bow and stern together. With some of the locks we had, I don't know what was going on, but they only had one person. So, you know, they, they pulled a the bow line, then later on, as we're drifting further and further away from the lock wall, with just a stern line, they'd eventually pull the stern line away. And um, it's, uh, you have to be prepared for that. So, your lines are free at this point, um, and you're, you're motoring out through the lock. Obviously, you go slow and careful, but enough speed to be able to steer with. And uh, you're out, out the lock. Some of the locks have bridges, either immediately in front of the lock or on the um, at, uh, other end of the lock. So just be aware of that. Again, you don't need to call anybody. They'll be opening the bridge as you're, as you're coming through and they, they know where you are. But just be aware that there's a lot of bridges that you're gonna go under as part of this experience. So that's your canal, um, your lock procedure. And then when you come out of the lock, uh, they may radio you and give you more instructions. Uh, you should expect to have to stop along the way. It's very rare that a flesh boat goes all the way through non-stop. We stopped three times. First time to stop was to get the dinghy up on the deck, unplanned stop there. The other two stops, they radioed us and they told us, okay, um, you know, Thalia, um, you'll need to uh, tie off at the LA-3 sign above lock four, or, or well, lock six or whatever. And so be listening to the radio for those instructions and um, you'll need to come into their walls uh, above the lock and wait out another ship coming through. Um, so the thing to keep in mind in, in that is again, it's a commercial operation. They don't have nice small fleets space close by for pleasure boats. They're these big, huge bollards that are probably, I don't know, foot and a half in diameter, gigantic things. They're set back from the seawall a uh, little ways, and they're spaced like every 100 feet, something ridiculous like that. So um, the two, actually all three of the walls that we tied off to were fairly well protected. They had a, a black rubber fender material all the way down along it, and uh, a couple times we bumped into that because the fenders weren't in the right spot and it scuffed the hull with a black mark but not, it didn't do any damage to the fiberglass, it was just a rubber um, uh, buff mark. So um, you, when you come into those you want to make sure you have your lines ready and your fenders and again be prepared to run extra long lines to get to the, the other bollard uh, to be able to hold yourself in position. You're going to probably see a lot of seagull or duck or goose uh, poop around too and you may have to hang out there for a while. We had to stop the first time for maybe half an hour, the second time for about an hour and waiting for traffic to come through. So it's actually a good time. We got we made some lunch for ourselves the first time which was nice. But be prepared for that to be able to, to be ready to pull over. When you um, come into those walls to, to, uh, to tie off, it's a good thing it's a courtesy to the um, canal authority to radio them when you're secure on the wall. So you just call them and say, Seaway Well and Seaway Well, this is Sailboat Thalia. We're all secured at LA3 above Block 6. And um, they have cameras all throughout the whole uh, canal area, so that more than likely they're seeing everything you're doing. But it's just a courtesy to let them know that you're all secure. And we did the same thing when we left the, uh, the wall. Um, we let them know, and when we left the wall, it was based on their directions, either their, them telling us on the radio that it was clear to go, or um, uh, we had been given instructions to leave after a certain ship passed through. So we would radio them and say, Thalia uh, is clear of, you know, um, has, has dropped lines and left the LA 3 side. Whatever instructions apply to your situation, it's a good courtesy to let them know that you've left 
that dock area. Um, so as I mentioned, there's a distance between uh, lock eight and lock seven. Go through lock seven, and then um, six, five, and four are all connected. So you go, for us, we went into lock six, and when you exit lock six, you immediately are going into lock five and lock four. You're doing the main, uh, the significant drop there that's related to the whole Niagara Falls area. You're gonna drop at 150 feet or so in those three locks. So you'll be working hard on that and busy going through those. Um, and then from there on, your next lock is lock three. Lock three is where the Canal Authority main office is and they have a viewing platform for visitors there. So you'll see that. Uh, if you have a chance to go there by land to check out the operation, it's kind of nice. Um, but that's lock three. And um, some of the some of the locks are double locks, meaning there's one path for the upbound vessels and another path instead of locks for the downbound. Um, other locks are shared, so the double locks obviously go faster if there's traffic, but the shared locks you're going to have to wait for other traffic to come through if, if that's the situation. Um, and then lock two and lock one. Um, after you go out of lock one, you're done. There's, as I mentioned, a courtesy dock, and which we stayed at overnight, just in the vicinity of Lock One. And but don't plan on a lot of space there. There was uh, two, two to three spots available on the wall there, but it was a nice place to for us to stop and rest and get some sleep, and then head out the next day. Um, so that's the process for the Well Canal. I hope this was helpful to you. And if you have any comments, uh, you know, if you've done the well canal have anything to add uh, definitely would appreciate if you could add comments to the video and uh, again I hope this was helpful